Hey everyone, Drive to School Podcast, Pastor Goodman, joined today by the apologist, David Zills. David, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Harrison. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. We made it through Labor Day. Uh, we are, we're, we're officially, I, I guess, done with summer. The, the weather's starting to reflect that. It's it's gray, it's cloudy, it's cool. I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm pretty good. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I'm not going to lie. Maybe I'll receive some judgment for this, but I'm excited for pumpkin spice season. You know, I, there's something about fall that just brings out my inner white girl. Um, <laughs> I get I go it. For boots, I go for sweaters. I, I yeah, let's, let's get cozy. <laughs> there, was, there was a recent time I was driving to, from one work location to another location. And, um, I realized I had pumpkin spice coffee and I was listening to Taylor Swift and I just kind of had to shake my head and be like, <laughs> David, <laughs> So many cards are in, in challenge here. Um, <laughs> yeah. Move right on. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Let's let's move on. Yeah, today we're going to talk about the Bible, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think last time we were talking about uh, tests for worldviews, and of course, Christianity is a worldview. There's postmodernism. There's scientific naturalism. There's Hinduism has its own flavor of different varieties of worldviews, and we talked about subjecting a worldview to reality. And since Christ Christianity is a historical religion, which often gets overlooked, but it's not a philosophical system where it's just a set of ethical principles that anybody could infer without revelation. It, you know, Christianity is a revealed religion. God had to step into history and do something or else there would be no Christianity. And so um, that means that the historical record of Christianity can be evaluated using tools any historian would use that's that matters because you're right if um if the bible has to stand out to say something different that you can't just assume from any other sort of looking at the world or any other religion where do we get it and um it, it's pretty easy to sort of get trapped in sort of a circular reason here that that doesn't really stand up to, to sort of outside questions right uh yeah that's uh i remember thinking about that because when you as Lutherans, we talk so much about the Bible as the word of God, which is very true. And it, 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 we emphasize the supernatural aspect that the Holy Spirit works through it. The Holy Spirit, you know, um, was intending the words to be written as they were. Um, and so sometimes we forget that there's a natural aspect to the Bible and when we do that, we can get in weird ways of thinking, because when someone says, when you say the Bible's the word of God, and that's your only way of thinking about the Bible, then someone can say, well, how do you know it's the word of God? And if your only way of thinking is, well, it just is, then you can get kind of stuck because, I mean, maybe you'll make an argument, which is what I, when I first started questioning my faith, I thought, well, I'll go to the catechism. The catechism has answers, you know, what does this mean? This is most certainly true. Surely there's something there. And uh, the thing is, in Luther's day, um, he did not have to contend with atheism as a respectable ideology because it just wasn't on the scene historically yet. And so he didn't have to debate whether the Bible was true. The debates Luther had were all about the authority and traditions and teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. And so he didn't have to debate the Bible. So you don't not surprisingly, the catechism wasn't super helpful. There was there were some proof texts, which, you know, when you start proof texting the Bible's the word of God, that's when you get the circular reasoning. You know, the Bible says all scripture is God breathed. Ah, so it's inspired. How do you know it's inspired? Because it says so. You know, and that's the circular reasoning part. So um, to break out of this, I think, you know, it, it can feel uncomfortable, but it's not at all bad theology. But we kind of have to take the word of God aspect of the Bible, which is true, but put it on a shelf. And if we want to ask, how do we know it's the word of God? We have to back into it by saying, well, let's just look at the Bible as anyone Christian or non-Christian would say it is and say it's a historical document. And that levels the playing field. And now since it's a historical document, we can subject it to tests to see if it's historically reliable. And it, if it's historically reliable, that means the events it describes really happened. It doesn't mean the theology it teaches is divinely inspired, but it's like a benchmark first rung of truth. And then from there, you can continue making the case. 
Right. And that's not a wrong thing to want to be able to do. After all, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And so if Jesus is the truth, you should actually not be worried about subjecting this to basic questions of, well, does this hold up to what we know to be true? Uh, but but even more so, um, this is not sort of saying like, let's, let's set aside God's uh, word as if it's not God's word, but it's simply saying that when God works, he works through means. And so when he works through baptism, baptism absolutely does save you. And he does that through water. God joins his word to an ordinary means of, of water. And we, we sort of overlook that because there's not a lot of reason to sort of test whether or not a thing is water. But in the same way, God's word is where he, he joins uh, his, his absolute salvific truth uh, to, to that which is, is uh, preached and written down and handed down through men. And so in the same way, there are ordinary means behind that in that there is paper and ink. It, it, there, is, uh, there are men who, 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 were, uh, who were there to witness these things, that the church operated in a, a, a function through means to, to pass these, uh, these, these words down through, uh, through time and history. All of those things can be evaluated and they, they don't take away from God's word being God's word, but rather they actually show all the more that no, this thing that God is, is promising to work through, it's reliable. Yeah, I think that's huge because sometimes when we emphasize the Bible as God's word, it sounds kind of like the whole book, all 66 books kind of came down from heaven and were presented to, I don't know, maybe the apostle Paul. And then he said, you know, <laughs> you know, this is most certainly true. And then that's how it got here. There are some religions that will claim their scriptures kind of came down from the heavens or something along those lines, you know, um, you know, I, I think, you know, Mormonism, you know, there were these golden plates and then he had to translate them and, the, the method of translation is now lost, but, and actually the golden plates are lost, but we have it. And so there's really not this traceability. Um, and then in Islam, you know, um, Muhammad what, heard a voice that said recite. And so that's how we got the Quran. It was revealed um, to him that way. And in the Bible, we have certain parts of the Bible that are revealed that way, where it's just a prophetic revelation to someone privately. You know, a lot of the prophetic books are that way. But when it comes to the testimony about Jesus in the New Testament, those are not um, private revelations. That's those are public events that were done. You know, as uh, it's either Peter or somebody in Acts who says this was not done in a corner. You know, it was public; people saw it, and so uh, it's these are historical events, and we have historical witness to these in the four Gospels. And I think the key when looking, when trying to think about is Christianity something I can have confidence in, is to not start with the question: Is the Bible the Word of God? But to say. First of all, is the Bible a reliable witness to who Jesus is? And then second of all, who is Jesus? Because if Jesus is just um, another man who died a pathetic death on a cross, then, you know, why are we worshiping him? Mm -hmm. But if Jesus is God, and there are, of course, other possibilities, I'm painting the two extremes, but if Jesus is God on the other extreme, then all of a sudden what Jesus says is the word of God. And so now we have something in the Bible, at least, that we can have confidence is the word of God. And, you know, I'm not saying the rest of it isn't, but it, you kind of make the case from Jesus outward. And so focusing on the question, who is Jesus and is the Bible a historical, a historically reliable witness to the life and teachings of Jesus? I think that's got to be the centerpiece of any historical investigation of Christianity. Absolutely. And it, it even just speaks directly to Lutherans. Um, first and foremost, it, it, in that we start with Jesus, um, because there, there's been a lot of people who have taken the Bible and said, all right, well, let's let's see what kind of wisdom we can glean from this. Let's see what kind of you know basic instructions before leaving Earth we can we can come up with. But but Lutherans say, well, who is who is Jesus? Did he die and rise again for our salvation? And if so, let's let's start there and, and let the scriptures speak about that. Um, so if, if this is the thing that then we need to, to examine, this is the thing that we need to, to evaluate. Uh, simply sort of approaching this in, in the, the question of, of what does this have to say about Jesus and, and is it something that, that makes internal and external sense uh, that, that we kind of talked about before? That, that seems like a great place to start. So how do we do it? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. So I think the key is, again, look at the Bible like any historical document, use tools historians use across the board. And the, the tests that historians use to evaluate the uh, the credibility of a historical document are pretty much common sense. Um, you can categorize them different ways, but they basically all have to do with uh, 
mainly two two main questions. One is the copies that we have of the document, like not not the Bible you have in your house, but like the ancient manuscripts that the are those um, how many of those do we have? And how far back do they go? And that the, those get at the question, was the document reliably copied? And so the, the surprising thing that can be a little disturbing at first is that we don't actually have the original copies of the Bible because they've been lost to history. We have copies of copies of copies. And so that can seem concerning because somewhere along the way, it could be like the telephone game and you lose you lose the original. And so the question is that the, as the scribes were copying these manuscripts and then you know the printing press came along and that sped up the process of copying. But if as this thing was copied from the first century to today, can we reconstruct uh, where errors came in, can we reconstruct what the original was all the way back and have confidence that say, this is what Paul wrote in Romans, or this is what Mark wrote in his gospel. And these were the words that he used, or at least the sense that he was, that he, you know, that he was getting at between these two variants of the, the text. And so the interesting thing is, this is actually in your Bible. When you look at the footnotes, it'll say, you know, some manuscripts say this, other manuscripts say that. And so a good Bible translation will have these notes. So that way, you know, where the variants are in the manuscript, and you can have confidence that where there aren't footnotes, you know, we, we we have a good de degree of confidence about what the original wording was. That makes sense. And, and I mean, you can think about it and, and see where it might raise some, some concerns. So, for example, if we had a, a religion that had a, a, a holy book that was subject to no sort of um, external means, it just sort of um, a deity spoke to a man hiding in a cave, and we didn't actually have any of those original books, and we couldn't check on the man, but it was 800 years before we actually got a copy. So 800 years of something between the first, the, the oldest version we have and what he claimed to have written down, a lot can happen in 800 years. And if we only have like one or two copies of it, well, then all of a sudden, well, what if something happened? But if we have documents that go back to within like, you know, 50 years, um, and we have lots and lots and lots of them, uh, well, the, the people who are operating there were close enough to remember. And so if a major change happened, it, it would make sense that they would sort of throw a flag on the play. And if, you know, somebody just sort of messed up one copy, we should have a lot of other copies that sort of point out where that happened. So so the more we have and the closer back they reach to the original time, I, I can see how that would add a lot of certainty. Yeah. And the the thing that uh, might surprise some people is that when it comes to historical documents, when we look at just the process of transmission over time, the copying, uh, we, ha we could have the most data supporting the reliable transmission of the Bible compared to any other historical document, like by an order of magnitude. So um, we have, I, I believe it's on the order of, well, let, let's let's set the, um, set the stage. So when it comes to other historical documents that we learn ancient history from, a lot of them, we have maybe 10 or single digit copies, like old manuscripts. And from that, we try to reconstruct what the original text said. And a lot of these manuscripts were, you know, as many as 500 or more years after the original document was written. So there was a lot of copying we have no trace of, and we just kind of have to have trust that no major errors crept in and that what we have, you know, in these manuscripts much after the original document was written is reliable. Now, and that's just how we do history with everything, right? It is. Yes. Yeah. So this is okay. not treating the Bible special. This is just basic historical research. Um, so in contrast, the Bible, um, or I should say the New Testament has 5,000 Greek manuscripts. I want to say it is about 2,000 translations. So not Greek manuscripts, but translations into like Latin and Syriac and other languages like that. Uh, which comes out to about 25,000 manuscripts. The most number of manuscripts that we have for any other ancient document, I think is for Homer's Iliad. And it's like something like seven or 800. And then, like I said, most historical documents, it's you know less than 20 um, or somewhere. It, it's not very many. So when it comes to the number of manuscripts, the, the New Testament is just by far, we can have the most confidence that what we have today is what was written then. 
right? I think somebody told me along the road too that like we believe that Julius Caesar was a person, right? Like we 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 don't really challenge that, but there's something like less than five pieces of written history that actually attest to him at all, and and we're we don't question whether or not he is real at all, um, and, and really even the the the, the story of, of his life and death, we we simply go with that because it's it's reliable history to us. Yeah. So yeah, that kind of brings up the argument that if we can trust historical documents with much less evidence, then when it comes to the transmission over time, we should have no real doubt that the, that the New Testament has been handed down reliably from the original writings. Now, this doesn't seal the deal because the original writings could have been um, legends when they were written. They could have been a hoax. And so you have to keep, continue to kind of work the timeline back, you know, from what we have today back to the original events and see if there's a reliable record all the way back. But when it comes to the transmission, the copying, the New Testament and its witness about Jesus is, is very solid. There's um, There are variants when it comes to disagreements between manuscripts, but because we have so many manuscripts, um, scholars are able to tease out which ones are likely to be in the original and trace it back. And so there, it, um, even secular scholars, you know, non-Christian scholars will admit that no major teaching of the Christian church is in jeopardy due to the process of transmission of the Bible, or at least the New Testament. Right. And this goes deep, too. It, it, it's not just sort of a question of like, well, if, if 24,999 people all said they saw an airplane and one person said they saw a Blair plane, we can probably figure out that there was a spelling error um, and, and go from there. But but even in, in terms of, of grabbing hold of the writings uh, on sort of our side of things to do the theology, uh, we have something called uh, prolegomena and homologomena, which is just a fun word to say. Um, but we, we, we have sort of uh, the, the primary teachings and then the like teachings. The, the primary words and the like words, if you want to get into the, the Greek. Um, and, and what this means is that we, we take not only uh, our scripture to make sure that it's all teaching the same thing, but if it's a sort of at all a contested source throughout any time in history, we'll say, all right, we're not going to base any teachings off of it, but we'll use those writings to support the teachings we already have. And the scriptures still stand that, that we can sort of... Uh, we, we can do this both historically and theologically uh, in, in a very normal and, and measurable fashion uh, that, that we don't simply sort, sort of say the Bible is God's word because the Bible says it's God's word. So trust the Bible that says it's God's word. Because I mean, if I did that with myself and I said, well, I am Batman and you can know that I am Batman because I say that I am Batman. <laughs> you see, <laughs> <laughs> That's, it's not, not particularly convincing. I mean, sorry, sorry. Harrison, I mean, I accept that. I mean, okay, I okay. <laughs> so um, I, I like then that, that we can actually start to, to, to poke at this. So what would you say then to somebody who said, you know, um, the, the Bible, all of the, the variants, they're, they're full of errors, they're full of mistakes. How do, how do we respond to that? Uh, first of all, that's true. Um, the manuscripts do show a lot of variation between them. And, um, but this is actually a good thing. Um, Because think about it, if you only had the one document, maybe 800 years after the original writing, you would have no variance because you have one document. So the more documents you have, the more opportunities you have for variations in uh, spelling and or actual wording or things like that to creep in. So the reason we have so many variants is because we have so much data. And because we have so much data, we can trace back the variants and figure out which one which ones are most likely to go back to the original. Um, second thing is most of the variants are either spelling issues, like you said, airplane or Blair plane, like that's not hard. You know, no one's going to say, well, we should, we should call into question the doctrine of the airplane because one person said Blair plane, you know, I mean, that's a little silly, but you know, um, no one would do that. So it's, a lot of these are simple spelling things. A, a lot of them are word order. So Greek, um, I studied Latin in high school, but I think Greek is the same way. Word order doesn't affect the meaning. So in English, if you say dog eats man or man eats dog, those are very different concepts. But in but in um, the Greek of the New Testament, the grammatical function of a word is not tied to its order in the sentence. And so you can reorder the words different ways and it still means the same thing so a lot of variants are like this 
Um, and so it turns out that very, very few of the variants actually affect meaning. And when they do, it's something that is not really substantial to Christian doctrine. I wish I had an example, but I'm not a textual critic. Um, but there, but there are things where you could say, you know, he walked into the bath versus he walked out of the bath. Okay, that that means something different, but it's not going to call into question was Jesus the Son of God, for example. And so, yeah, so the variants they're there, but they're there because we have so many manuscripts, and because of that, there's there's no question due to the transmission of documents through time. That, that calls into question any Christian doctrine. You can go before the original documents were written, and that's something that maybe has to be treated a little more carefully. But once they're written, the, the words that we have today, we are very, very close and do not call into question you know, anything that they believed at the time of the writing. Right. And, and we're, we're upfront about that, too. It's, it's nice that we actually sort of invite that that recognition that it's not simply all of it is the absolute unquestionable thing. But we sort of say, you, have you ever read the, the last chapter of Mark where uh, we, we get to the long ending and, and we say the earliest manuscripts didn't have this? It, it, it might have actually been added later by by church historians and it doesn't contradict anything. But at the same time, we're absolutely not going to base anything new out of this. Um, and, and that's all right. We're going to be upfront about where this came from. We're going to be upfront about what that means. And we're going to be upfront about the fact that you can check on it and also check on it to realize it, it doesn't actually change the meaning. Yep. Yep. So I think, uh, you know, maybe in future sessions, we can spend more time on, you know, maybe the original writings, we can have a good sense of what they were saying, but how do we know those were reliable? Who wrote these? Are they anonymous? Were they charlatans making this up? Was it a legend? You know, we can get into those questions. And I think that's where more of the meat is when it comes to is the New Testament a reliable historical witness to who Jesus was and what he said. Um, so I think plenty of room for future discussion, but um, if anyone wants to dig into something more scholarly because you and I are not textual critics scholars. We we read this stuff, but we don't do it. Um, but Dan Wallace is um, one of the leading textual critics. Textual criticism just means the study of the transmission and, and the manuscripts that we have to try to recover the original wording. And Dan Wallace is the leading expert on that within the conservative Christian circle. He's a professor down at Dallas Theological Seminary. And he wrote a book with a couple others called Reinventing Jesus. Um, and it's something, the subtitle is something about how popular skeptics miss the real Jesus and mislead popular culture. So it gets into a bunch of um, a bunch of misconceptions about how we got the Bible and kind of sets the record straight by looking at the historical data. And it gets into this issue of the the manuscripts and how you trace back to get the original wording. So for further reading, that's a great resource. Awesome. Re Reinventing Jesus, Dan Wallace. Thank you, David. It was great to have you here. Uh, thanks for joining us on the drive to school. Sounds good. Thanks.